thank you all for being here. I'm uh, really uh, thrilled and honored and excited and think it's a lot of fun to get to have a conversation with George, who, among other things, is famously known as the person who proved that Asians really can drive. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so let's start by, you know, we actually are fortunately have a pretty long history. Um, and I want to start by talking about 1965 and uh, the founding of East West Players in Los Angeles. Uh, my dad was the bookkeeper for the organization uh, because he was uh, close to Beulah Kuo, uh, who's a wonderful Chinese American actress. Um, and talk about your your like, how did you guys come up with this idea? What was the, let's talk about the foundations of East West. Well, East West Players today is the um, oldest minority theater in the United States. Not just in Los Angeles or California, but in the United States. Uh, there was a, a, an African American group in uh, Harlem that was older, but they went belly up a few years ago. So uh, this Asian American theater is the oldest continuously operating uh, theater company in the United States. And David and I both have a, a intertwined relationship there. That includes Beulah Kuo. She is a pillar of uh, the East West Players. Uh, she was one of the founders of East West Players back in 1965. Uh, I was there to uh, talk about it, but I was cast in a uh, series called Star Trek. <laughs> <laughs> and so I could not be active in the founding of the theater. But uh, uh, I think almost all Asian, uh, Asian American theater artists have some connection with uh, the East West Players. It was the organization that did uh, your favorite, uh, fav first play, FOV. And uh, it's produced a lot of actors and uh, writers, directors uh, over the, the last uh, 50 years, 51 <coughs> years now. Uh, Beulah and I were active in the uh, uh, performing arena of uh, theater. But it was, uh, we were work working in a 99 seat theater, first in the church basement, and then a storefront on Santa Monica Boulevard in Los Angeles. We felt that uh, with the kind of success that we've been enjoying, it needed to be a bigger theater, a mid-sized theater. And in Little Tokyo, we had a uh, historic church that was empty. The, the congregation had moved on. It was a classic, neoclassic uh, piece of architecture. The first, very first Japanese-American Christian church in uh, Los Angeles. And we uh, thought it would be a wonderful adaptive uh, reuse project as a theater. Uh, but to do that, we needed money. And we knew someone who, who was, whose father was a banker. <laughs> David's father, who shares the same name, Henry Wong, uh, was a very distinguished banker in the Asian American community and in the larger community as well, financial community. And uh, uh, Beulah uh, knew him well. I knew him, but I didn't know him as well as Beulah. So the two of us went to uh, speak to Henry. It was really hard to speak to. How did you uh, convince him? <laughs> well, <laughs> he's a very proud man and a very proud father. And that was his vulnerable area. <laughs> <laughs> because at a certain point, he was like, my dad was like, OK, we're going to make this donation to East West, and they're going to name the theater after you. <laughs> and I was like, oh, it's a little over the top. But, <laughs> but really, my first association was, was with East West was in the late 60s, they did a production of Minotti's Operetta the Media, which they reset in post-war Japan. And my mom was the rehearsal camp. So right. I was about 10 years old, and I would hang around rehearsals. And I think it's not surprising in retrospect that I ended up um, thinking it was not so strange for Asian Americans to be actors, directors, leaders of artistic organizations uh, when I grew up. Um, 
So I want to go forward a little to 1975 because um, other than, of course, being really thrilled and proud to see you on Star Trek, in 1975, I turned on my TV and on PBS, there was a, a television adaptation of Frank Chin's play, uh, Year of the Dragon, and you played the lead in that. And that was hugely influential for me, and I was uh, so proud and moved by it. And you know, Frank has hated me ever since my own place got produced. But that's Frank hates me. I don't take it for it. Um, but anyway, it was he was still a great inspiration to me. So like, so talk about. Do you have any Frank stories and what it was like? <laughs> by that laugh, I gather some of you know uh, what Frank Chin is like. He is a passionate man. He's a very intense man, and he is a man who has an agenda. And um, he feels that the whole white world is against him. <laughs> and that's his big uh, axe to grind. And, but uh, his earlier plays, uh, the axe wasn't that sharply honed. And it was much more accessible, wouldn't you say, here at the dragon. It's essentially a father-son relationship. But that uh, relationship uh, also is with his sister, who is married now to a white guy, and uh, his younger brother. Now, this takes place in uh, Chinatown, San Francisco. And uh, his younger brother is now mixing with uh, young Asian gangs. And he sees uh, the, uh, the community and his family changing. And he blames it all on his authoritarian father, but also very uh, self-important father. And it's that conflict. Uh, Father-son stories are always good uh, drama. And they also are wonderful roles to play, whether you're the father or the son. I, I had my fun playing the son, and now I'm not only playing the father, but I'm playing <laughs> grandfather. <laughs> Because Japanese American fathers are, first of all, uh, single-minded in wanting something from their first son. I was the oldest in the family, and a son. And uh, he was in real estate, and he um, envisioned me as an architect. I think he kind of fancied the idea of putting out a sign eventually that said, to Kay and son, real estate development. I would design the buildings and he would develop them. But, um, well, as a good son, you know, I, my father on Sundays would take me to construction sites all over uh, uh, Los Angeles. And he took me to one a Sunday afternoon, took me to the, this great big excavation on Bunker Hill in downtown Los Angeles. And he said, Here on this end of this big hole will be an opera house. And in the middle will be a mid-sized theater, and in the far side would be a larger theater. It's going to be called the Music Center. And sure enough, now it is as my father predicted. Uh, and um, I remember another Sunday when he took me to uh, Beverly Hills, <coughs> to another big hole. And he said, this is going to be a great luxury hotel. And there in that hole now stands the Beverly Hilton Hotel. <laughs> and. Uh, uh, he guided me to uh, express an interest in architecture. And as a good son, I began my college career as an architecture student. But after two years, I uh, <clears throat> had to be true to myself. My burning passion was acting. And uh, I told my father, I came back down to Los Angeles, and I said to him, I'd like to go to New York and study at the actor's studio. That's where all the great actors come from. Marlon Brando, James Dean, Montgomery Cliff. And I might <clears throat> be at selling uh, the actor's studio to my father. But uh, apparently he had done his research. He said, yes, I know about the actor's studio. It's a fine, distinguished, respected acting school. But after you finish there, they won't give you a diploma which says, you're a legitimately educated person. Your mother and I want you to have that, at least. And so I've got a deal to offer you. But you're a bullheaded kid. You're going to insist on going to New York. 
So let me start off by saying, if you go to New York, let me remind you, New York is a very crowded place, it's a very competitive place, and it's a very expensive place. And you have to be prepared to do it all on your own. However, in town, in Los Angeles, we have a distinguished university called UCLA. And they have a fine theater arts department. And if you study there and finish, they'll give you a diploma. That's what we want from you. So if you go to UCLA, you'll have a subsidy. We'll subsidize you. <laughs> so you choose. <laughs> New York on your own or UCLA. <laughs> He was a good deal maker. He <laughs> went to UCLA. I went to UCLA. <laughs> um, and let me just wind back a little bit here, Dad, because you're talking about him taking you to see these places, which suggests that he was able to sort of have a career after the war. Um, how did he deal with the aftermath of internment? That was another part of it by my father that uh, I, I saw and I experienced and my love for him grew uh, even uh, deeper there. Our first home back in Los Angeles after uh, the internment was Skid Row. Those of you that saw uh, Allegiance, you know that all we got was a one-way ticket to anywhere in the United States plus $25. He had three children, me, my younger brother, and our baby sister, and my family of five. We each got $25. The hostility was still very strong. It was difficult to find a job. It was difficult to find housing. But my father, who was a block manager in both camps that we were in, a uh, rower in the swamps of Arkansas, and then we were, tra we were transferred to uh, to the lake. Uh, my parents were both known as on the loyalty questionnaire. Uh, and <clears throat> uh, so uh, when we came home, uh, opportunities were non existent. Housing opportunities were not. Skid Row was the only place. And yet, my father, because he was block manager, uh, he was. Uh, giving advice, giving counsel to the people in our block, uh, and also representing that block with the camp uh, administration. Uh, they came to him for help, even after camp. And so we opened an employment office in Little Tokyo to find employment for uh, particularly the older Japanese-speaking uh, people coming back. Uh, the kinds of jobs that he could find for them was as dishwashers, janitors, gardeners, which paid a pittance. And his fee would be a small percentage of that pittance. I remember going, my mother taking us from after school, from a, a school to my father's office, and uh, they would give us um, employment forms and, we, uh, and, and a box of crayon. And we sprawled on the, uh, the floor of the back room and drew pictures while uh, my mother did some filing and my father uh, talked with the clients. My mother made him quit that because she said, we have to eat too. I mean, we can't eat like this. And so um, after about uh, a half a year of that, um, we moved from an all Japanese American community to Skid Row and then into an all Mexican American community in East LA. And, uh, we felt very welcome there. It was a minority community of Latinos, well, Mexicans, Mexican-Americans, immigrants, and uh, native Poles. And uh, my father opened a, a cleaner, dry cleaning shop with an apartment behind it. And I made a lot of Mexican-American friends who invited me to, uh, uh, walking back from school, to their mother's kitchen. And I, uh, they, they would give me a, bean burritos, fresh made uh, 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 tortillas. And my mother made good, uh, good friends with our neighbor, Mrs. Gonzalez, and she learned how to cook Mexican. And I still to this day believe that the best enchiladas and uh, tacos 
were made by Mrs. Takei. <laughs> <laughs> Not Mrs. Gonzalez. <laughs> um, Rover, Arkansas. So you were initially in the, in the camp in Rover, and another mutual friend of ours and artistic collaborator, Philip Gotonda, the playwright who's a, a good friend of mine and whose work you've done, Philip's parents, I believe, were also in Rover. Um, and then you were transferred to, to leave your parents because they were no no people, boys, girls, um, got transferred to Julie Lake, which was you know the, 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 the rebellious camp. Um, and I assume you went with them. Did you notice a difference in how Tule Lake was administered and what sort of uh, privileges or freedoms you had or whatever vis-a-vis uh, -vis Rower? Not, not so much uh, with the administration. My father was a block manager, as I said, mm -hmm. in Rower and in uh, Tule Lake. Uh, what I remembered about uh, uh, Rover was that it, it's southeastern Arkansas. It was lush. We were in the swamps, the, the trees, and uh, lots of water and muck and, and uh, uh, cypress uh, roots that uh, undulated uh, up and down in the, uh, in the muck. And, it, uh, and I had fun in uh, Rover. Tule Lake was something quite different. It was a very dry, sear, uh, dry lake bed. It was sandy, but it wasn't the soft sand of the beach. It was hard, hard sharp, gritty uh, sand. That, you know, it, and then when the wind blew, it really you know, cut into your face. And uh, the uh, tumbleweeds were always rolling around in, uh, on that uh, very cold. It was cold and very sear. Uh, and it was a much uh, more uh, uh, highly uh, secured camp. There were three layers of barbed wire fences, and we occasionally saw tanks patrolling the uh, perimeter. Uh, it was a cold place, bitterly cold in the wintertime, and in the summertime it was nice, but uh, still not a pleasant place. And it was also an intensely politicized uh, camp because this was a camp of people that uh, answered no no to the uh, loyalty questionnaire. Uh, in imprisonment, a year after imprisonment, this loyalty questionnaire came down, very sloppily uh, put together. But the two most uh, controversial questions were outright offensive and insulting. Everyone over the age of 17 had to respond to it. Man, a, a, a male or female, 17 or 87, immigrant or American born. Quest, uh, question 27 asked, will you bear arms to defend the United States of America a year after they took everything from us and imprisoned us? This being asked of a 17-year-old young man, but also being asked and an answer required from an 87-year-old immigrant lady. How is she supposed to say yes to that? It was outrageous. But even more insidious <coughs> was question 28, which was one sentence with two conflicting ideas. Essentially, I'm paraphrasing, but essentially it asked, will you swear your loyalty to the United States of America and forswear your loyalty to the Emperor of Japan? The word forswear assumes that we have an existing loyalty to the <coughs> We're Americans, born here, raised here. It was insulting for the government to say, I have a loyalty to, well, I was a child and I didn't have to answer that, but um, for my parents to have to uh, say, I have an existing loyalty that I will now forswear. So if you answer no, meaning I don't have a loyalty to the emperor, you were also saying no to the first part of the very same sentence. If you answered yes, meaning I do swear my loyalty to the United States, then you were confessing that you had been loyal to the emperor and now were willing to set that aside, forswear it, and re-pledge your loyalty to the United States. My father said, and this line is in the, uh, in the musical, they took my business, they took our home, they took our freedom. The one thing I'm not going to give them is my dignity. I will not 
grovel before this government. And so for that, I consider very principled position, gutsy position, and allegiance to not only your own, your own principle, but principle to, to what America really stands for. A very American position. They were labeled disloyal and sent to a Thule Lake. And so because you have a camp filled with these people, uh, young men, a good number of young men, became radicalized. Their attitude was, all right, you're going to treat me like the enemy. By gum, I'll show you what, who you have to contend with. And I remember waking up in the morning to uh, those young men jogging around the block. They had uh, what they call hachimaki headbands, and they had painted on them here the, the Japanese military flag, the rising sun. And they jog jogged around with the Japanese cadence, washoi, washoi, washoi. And I remember hearing that sound, washoi, washoi, as they jogged around the uh, uh, block. And when they finished their jog, they would go, banzai, banzai, banzai. These were radicalized young men, and they were goaded into that position by the outrage committed by this government, the United States government. Let's use this as a transition to start talking about allegiance, uh, which I uh, finally got to see this weekend, and um, it's really extraordinary. You guys have done a fantastic job, and one of the things I think that's uh, amazing about the piece from a dramaturgical standpoint is just a series of impossible choices that these people are faced with. And they, you know, they sort of try to navigate through one impossible choice, and then, oh, that causes another impossible choice. And so they're constantly in this, this, this vice that's, that's uh, uh, closing in. Um, and it rips apart families, and it's very moving. And so congratulations. I think it's, it's fantastic. And I, you know, well, well, the credit goes to three very gifted uh, writers, uh, Mark Asito, <coughs> Lorenzo Tioni, who's also the uh, lead producer, and Jay Kuo, who's also the uh, composer lyricist. They, I have great admiration for that. So let's talk about they. This project came about somewhat happenstancedly, right? I mean, you guys were like in a, you were sitting behind each other or something like that. I don't call it happenstance. <laughs> no, <laughs> I call it the theater gods. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Brad and I go to the theater regularly, uh, every night sometimes, uh, for a whole week. And uh, one night we went to see um, uh, Forbidden Broadway. We're musical theater fans, and uh, it's a terrible treatment of uh, Broadway musicals. It's something that we find a lot of fun, too. So we went there, and um, it was early. Not, not too many people were seated. And we were seated chit-chatting uh, between us. And uh, two guys came in and sat right in front of us. And they heard us talking. And they heard my voice. And one of them turned around and said, you're George Sakei, aren't you? And so uh, we chit-chatted. That uh, young man was Jay Quart, uh, the uh, composer lyricist, who also is a practicing attorney, a brilliant attorney. He's uh, argued uh, the Supreme Court. So he's a man of many talents. And the guy with him was Lorenzo Tione. And we chatted with him during the intermission. And we went back to our apartment thinking, oh, those guys are really passionate theater lovers. The next night, we went to see uh, the uh, Tony Award winning musical, In the Heights, but written by another uh, 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 very gifted uh, theater person, Lynn Manuel Miranda, who wrote uh, Hamilton, which is sucking up all the money in <laughs> <laughs> Broadway uh, this season. Um, and uh, we uh, found our seats, and we were about to sit down when we noticed two arms waving at us in the same row. And we looked over, and it was a two, the same two guys <laughs> waving at me this time in the very same row. And I, I said to Brad, isn't that a coincidence? It's those two same guys. And Brad whispers to me, I think they're stalking us. <laughs> and then the musical started. Near the uh, end of the first act, the father, uh, it's a Puerto Rican story, 
uh, in the Washington Heights area, right this area, I guess. Um, there's a, a bright, very talented uh, daughter who wants to go to college, and the father wants to, be, uh, to make her, uh, help her get to college, but he can't. And he so sings a song, Inut, which means useless. And it's a horrible, moving song. And somehow that song made my mind click to a conversation I had with my father as a teenager, asking him about our incarceration. And he was telling me about being confronted you know, with the uh, loyalty questionnaire and how anguishing, how, how difficult, how painful it was for him to uh, respond to that questionnaire. And hearing this uh, song, I'm a weeper to begin with. And I, I started cascading tears. And then, of course, the intermission comes, and the lights go on. And uh, the two guys came clambering over knees to chit-chat again. And they see me wiping my tears uh, off my face. And they asked me what triggered that. And we, I told them, and we started talking about the uh, internment. And then we had to quit, because this, uh, the next act was going to begin. And so we went out for drinks after that and talked some more. And then we decided to have dinner tonight. And, uh, and that eventually uh, uh, resulted in our deciding to work on a musical on the, the internment of Japanese Americans. As, as this show was going through its writing and rewriting process, um, what do you feel were some of the major things that change from when you originally did a production at the Old Globe in San Diego, uh, and then a few years went by, and, and now you've made it to Broadway. Um, what are some of the major changes that happened? Well, when we um, opened uh, in San Diego at the uh, world premiere, uh, incidentally, the New Yorkers kept refer referring to our world premiere as the Auto Town Tryout, <laughs> the arrogance of New Yorkers. <laughs> very um, enlightening ex experience. Uh, we wanted to uh, make the uh, drama as truthful as possible, but we learned that sometimes you can be too truthful to your disadvantage. Uh, we have one character who's a real uh, character. The others are all fictional, but the events are all true events. Uh, the, that character is Mike Masaoka, the National Secretary of the Japanese American Citizens League. And he, he's a very complex person to begin with. And he played a uh, critical role in the internment of Japanese Americans. He, uh, I have to choose my word, uh, care, words carefully, he uh, cooperated and uh, uh, was complicit in the uh, internment of Japanese Americans, but also the creation of the 442nd. Many of the uh, events that happened, Mike Mark Masoka was a uh, uh, party to, but he was also a divisive character. Uh, those that resisted, uh, or yes, resisted the uh, internment and challenged it all the way to the Supreme Court were vilified by Mike Masoka. Uh, those that answered no, no to the loyalty questionnaire, he saw as cowards and traitors because they did not agree with uh, his stance, which was to uh, comply and to work with the government. I, uh, my parents were no-nos, and obviously I, I don't quite agree with that, but we tried to depict that uh, truthfully. We also wanted to tell the epic story of the Japanese Americans, the, uh, uh, the uh, complete story, the story of the resistors, because they get very little spotlighting in the telling of the Japanese American internment experience. The 442nd are true heroes. They fought heroically, and the 442nd is still the most decorated unit and the most honored unit 
of the entire um, in the entire military history of the United States. But we wanted to tell the complete story, both sides. And so we characterized uh, both sides as heroes and uh, uh, used the words that they used. However, um, and that fracturing of the community still exists. And uh, the other side uh, protested bitterly, and particularly the, characteri the characterization of uh, Mike Masawa. We wanted to tell the story, and we didn't want um, that to become a hindrance to our getting the show on Broadway. And so we took some of the words that Mike Masawa used, uh, words like, call uh, like calling uh, the uh, resistors uh, traitors and cowards. And we put that into the fiction character, Sandy, and made him a, a bit less uh, harsh. And uh, we had uh, Mike Masaka's um, uh, nephew see the uh, play uh, in the previews. And he told us that it is a balanced portrayal. The Japanese American Citizens League, which he represented, was also uh, active in that kind of, contributing to that kind of fracture. Uh, Philippine one group, and uh, and uh, the uh, head of the uh, Japanese American Citizens League now, uh, Pris uh, 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 Priscilla Ochi, uh, saw it and she said it's a balanced betrayal. And the former uh, national president of the JACL and uh, uh, a uh, exec, uh, uh, then later the executive director of the JACL. Uh, wrote a uh, review of the of, uh, allegiance and said uh, it is a balanced uh, betrayal and he urged members of the JCL to see allegiance. So uh, we've had, had that, I would say the characterization of Masaka uh, was uh, a big change. There were other, you know, there were production numbers that were dropped, new ones created, <coughs> but the major one was uh, the betrayal of Mike Masaka. Um, which, yeah, I also found incredibly fair and balanced. And um, I felt that even when the JACL was complaining about the show before they'd seen it, um, they never actually said it was wrong. They just sort of didn't like that they were, you know, that you guys were preparing. Um, well, it's their heritage. Yeah. And that was betrayed. And uh, they were concerned about their legacy. Mm -hmm. um, so go, as you're doing this show eight times a week, um, what are what are what are your favorite moments every night, and what is the thing that uh, you anything still make you a little nervous every night? Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have uh, two favorite moments. One is uh, Ishikaraishi, which means stone by stone. It's a song I sing with my granddaughter, and. Um, the theme of uh, allegiance is transformation. Here, this ugly thing happened to us, but it made me who I am. I was transformed by that experience, defined and shaped by that experience. And whatever we do, every little bit contributes to that. We have the logo of the show is an origami flower. But that origami flower is made out of that hateful, ugly, loyalty questionnaire. Something hateful, treated with art, can become something beautiful. And a mountain, heart mountain, that big mountain, too, can be moved stone by stone. And we have this number, a grandfather singing with his granddaughter a song that he sang for her from the time that she was a little girl. And that philosophy of working diligently to, to face a big challenge, and you can overcome it by moving one little bit after another. And so that's a moment that I like. And the uh, other uh, favorite moment is the final scene, where this um, calcified, bitter, angry man in his late in his life who spent a half a century estranged from his family 
finally, when he hears of the death of his sister. I shouldn't tell you too much. <laughs> <laughs> Just dumb dumb. Stay tuned, or better yet, come to the meeting. <laughs> um, but I wanted to go back to the casting question and ask you to comment a little bit on the racial dynamics involved, whereas on the one hand, we protested Miss Saigon when they cast whites, they, they hired whites to play Asians. Um, and, and it's important that Asians play Asians um, and African Americans play African Americans. Um, on the other hand, it's a great achievement that Hamilton is, you have our founding fathers, you know, played by people of color. Um, and I, I consider it a great achievement when an Asian actor plays Othello. You know, these are also, so I think there's, and I, you know, I think it's, it's not inconsistent because it's about struggling for equality and that takes different forms. But I wonder if you could comment a little bit on that and if you ever get pushback on, on these kinds can of can issues. Can I do that first and then yeah, you're going to talk? It's a favorite subject of mine. Um, I think it is a false equivalency yeah. to say that because um, people of color play white roles, that that creates this, some sort of license for white people to play uh, roles of color. And the reason, and I like to just look at it as an employment issue. So 80% uh, roles that are cast in Broadway and the 10 major um, uh, not-for-profits in New York are cast with Caucasian actors. So it, um, that would be a bad diversity figure, I think, in most industries. And so that's why it leads to, I think, a certain amount of aesthetic inconsistency, which is um, I like it when a actor of color plays a white role because that um, decreases the 80%. And I don't like it when the reverse happens, because that increases the 80%. I think it's a matter of trying, and that's how it, we end up trying to create equal opportunity, is creating more opportunities for people of color to appear on our major stages and decrease that 80% figure. I think he's answered it. <laughs> <laughs> the allegiance, we have an Asian American cast for a Japanese American story. And you know we're actors. I've played Korean, I've played Vietnamese, I've played Chinese. I mean, we, you know, uh, we all share the same ethnic background, and that's what counts. Uh, Italians can play Spaniards or Polish or uh, Puerto Rican. You know, uh, we are all actors. We create the illusion of truth, and Telly as me. Telly Leong playing the young me is, is very credible. He's amazing. He's a wonderful Italian guy. He's Chinese American. I'm Japanese American. We are actors. We can play each other. And we're the same ethnic group. So, uh, uh, you know, people uh, say, oh, well, how can the Chinese play a Japanese? Or the same character? Well, I'm, I'm uh, playing the older version of the young Telly, and uh, I think Telly is brilliant as me. <laughs> 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 <laughs>